Well, it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, and I'm glad you're here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation to stand in the pulpit of Southwest Baptist Church. And, and it is like a family reunion every time we come here. Such a joy to see folks that have just stayed by the stuff, just stayed in church, keep on going, serving God. What a great blessing that is to our heart. And thank the Lord for the Southwest Baptist Church that has certainly been a, a great source of light to Oklahoma City and around the world for a long, long time. And, and uh, I, I just, uh, it's, just a, it's just very humbling to be here. And I, uh, <clears throat> I am glad you're here because it ain't any fun to holler unless you have somebody to holler at. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 10 in your Bible tonight, if you would, the book of Jeremiah, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, chapter number 10. <clears throat> Thank you, Rogers family. That song kind of got to me, got to me a little bit there. We don't have to live in the past, do we? No. No, we don't. I am thankful for everything the Lord has brought us through over the years, and I only share that at times, and with my track that I have been printing for some time anyway, because there's a lot of people that think there's no hope, but there is hope. In the Lord Jesus Christ, He's a He's a He is a life changing God for sure, and I'm very 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 thankful for that. Very thankful for that. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter ten, and look all the way down to verse number twenty three, please, if you would. <clears throat> the Bible says, "O Lord." I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. <clears throat> We're going to think about these verses in the message tonight, and I just titled the message itself, We Need Help. That's me and you. We need help. Let's pray and we'll get, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this place. And we thank you for what we've already experienced here tonight. Father, the congregational singing, always a joy to hear the saints of God singing out. The special music that we've heard, uh, Lord, in both cases was a great blessing. And Lord, now just the opportunity to open up your book one more time. And we've prayed for your power, but we pray for it again. Lord, we need your help. We do. We do all the way across the board. And I need your help right now. So Lord, just bless the preaching of your message. Do what only you can do. <clears throat> we trust you to speak to hearts and do the work that needs to be done through the preaching of your word. And we'll give you honor and glory and praise for anything that's accomplished. For we do ask it all in Jesus Christ's wonderful name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for standing. Please do be seated. My good sound man, if you would be so kind to mute me for a second. Could you do that? That'd be, that'd be, that'd be good. Nobody want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a second. I've got an extra. <laughs> That's a good thing. <clears throat> the text we read tonight is from the closing portion of Jeremiah's message in the temple gate. And the full message covers chapter 7 through chapter 10. Wonderful message from God to the people of God. 
And we know that Jeremiah was a prophet. He prophesied before and during the captivity of the exile of Judah. He was a prophet of God that was sent to warn the people of their coming captivity. And the message at the temple gate was uh, really, it's just a plain cry to God's people to repent. Uh, no, that's a good Bible word. To, to repent, to turn back to the Lord. No, we have to understand that this was a message from God. It's from God. Jeremiah chapter seven, verse one, the Bible says this, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye Jew of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So the message was given from God to Jeremiah to take to the people. And uh, the message was, that was proclaimed there in the gate of the Lord's house was a message from a grief-stricken, broken-hearted man of God. What, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that this wasn't just some old mean-spirited preacher that was like, you better get right with God or God's going to get you. Not the way it was. Come on. We know Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, right? No, no, he was brokenhearted for his people. He wanted them to turn back to God. He wanted the very best for them. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter nine, verse one, the Bible says, oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. So this man was grieved over what, what uh, of the direction that the people were going and he just wanted them to turn back to God and God gave him a message to carry to the people. <clears throat> but here at the end of his message, it also contained a personal prayer for God's help in the situation. And when we read it there in verse number 24, where he cries out, O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. O oh Lord, correct me. This is the cry of a man of God. This isn't an unsaved person because only a believer can cry out, oh Lord, correct me. No, no, a lost person can't make that plea. The cry of the unsaved needs to be, oh Lord, save me. Because, no, no, it's always salvation before correction. Come on, God saves us and then he begins a process to clean us up. And it is a process. Pastor said so. And that's the way that it is. Get saved by the grace of God. God makes a change on the inside that only he can make. Mm -hmm. He moves in and he begins to do a work in here that works its way out to the outside and he continues to work on us for the rest of our days. Amen. Trying to get us to that place that he wants us to be. We are to be conformed, uh, according to Romans chapter 8 verse 29, we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's going to take a lot of work yeah, right. on all of us. Yes, Absolutely so. <clears throat> We know this, an unsaved person's blind. They can't see the life that they're living is even wrong. And most of us that are sitting here tonight can think of some things that we wish we would have never done when we were lost and without God. I mean, things that we'd never ever do again, things that, that we, we would never do today because of the changes that God has made in our lives. And we have to understand this, and I know it's very basic, but it's really an important part of getting to the end of this message. God is the heavenly father of those that have trusted Jesus Christ as their savior. No, no, you can't call him father unless you've truly been born again by the spirit of God. He is God to everybody, but he's heavenly father to those that have trusted Christ. He's the father of the saved, not a father of the lost. And we have to understand this, which is basic too, but a father corrects his own children. Not the children of others. He corrects his own children. But this is also the cry of a more mature Christian. Not a babe in Christ. Uh, okay, uh, babies don't cry for correction. They don't want correction. No, 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 no. Babies don't, don't want that. Babies want what they want. They're selfish. They're self-centered. Oh, if you don't believe that, spend some time in the nursery. Oh, those little babies, they're so cute. They're a bunch of sinners. That's what they are, a bunch of liars, a bunch of sinners. Yeah, they may be cute, but no, 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 they're a bunch of sinners because you just give them what they want, they'll be fine. Absolutely so. They don't want correction. 
No, this is a cry from a man. Listen to this. This is a, this is a cry. Come on, brain. This is a cry from a man who wants God's blessing on his life, no matter the price. Whatever it costs. No matter what God has to do. And you're not going to hear somebody pray a prayer like this that's only thinking of themselves. Oh, no, 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 no. So bottom line, this is a personal cry. I do believe that, that Jeremiah had the people of Israel in his mind, yet this man of God made it a personal prayer. I mean, he realized his own need for correction. He realized that he wasn't where he needed to be in, in his walk with God, and, and that were still some things hindering him from being everything that God would have him to be. And there may, be, there may just be someone here this evening that, that needs to cry out, Lord, correct me. I, I need your help. Lord, I have a desire to be what you would have me to be, but I'm failing miserably. Right. And please, please just help me get back to you. Help me get back to that place I know I need to be. And that's not a bad thing. Right. Oh, no, 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 it's not, that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, it's a very good thing. A heart that yearns for God is, is, is wonderful. But taking the steps to get to where we need to be is necessary. No, it's necessary. I mean, even though it's going to take humbling ourselves to get there. Absolutely so. Because see, there was a confession that Jeremiah made. Uh, wait a minute, Brother Marshall. Um, confession? Uh, yes. Mm, I don't see any confession there. Oh, no, here it is. I, I can read it for you. Oh, Lord, correct me. Right, that's good. Oh, no, there had to be something wrong. Why would he cry out like that if there wasn't something wrong? And so, so he's confessing, I, 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 I need this. Now you think about this. this. This preacher had been pointing out the sins and the faults of the people throughout this whole message in the temple gate in chapter 7 all the way through 10. And he had preached against their backsliding. He had preached about their idol worship. He had brought to their attention their indifference toward God. He had called them a bunch of wicked sinners. He had tried to convince them about their own spiritual blindness. And he had, he, he, uh, had hope that through the preaching of God's message that they would come to the point of confessing their wickedness and their sinfulness. Right. And again, it may be that someone in here needs to cry out to our God, oh Lord, correct me. And listen to me, please. You might not be in some horrible sin, but you might not be near where you need to be with God. And maybe the prayer just needs to be, dear God, correct my tongue, correct my thoughts, correct my habits, correct my anger, correct my gossip, correct my critical spirit, correct my negative attitude. Oh Lord, correct my self-sufficiency. Yes. Right. Nothing stunts spiritual growth like self-sufficiency. Right. Now we're headed for big trouble when we think we can handle our sinfulness on our own. We cannot handle our sinfulness on our own. Right. Preach, I'm trying so hard to change. Can't do it without God. You can't get saved without God. You're not going to change without God. He saves us by his grace and he changes us by his grace. That's our God. <clears throat> John chapter 15, verse five, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me uh, and, and I in him, uh, the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. Spiritually, nothing. Oh, we can go through the motions. We can come to church. We can carry a Bible. We can dress our best. We can work a bus route. We can teach a Sunday school class. We can knock on a few doors. We can go through the motions. But without him, we can do nothing spiritually. And the sooner we realize that word nothing means nothing, the better off we're going to be without. Because without him, we can do nothing. And, and you know, a characteristic of true believers all down through the centuries has been that of confession. It's been that of confession. You think about King David. In Psalm chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Psalm 6, 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord. For I'm weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. 
And of course, the famous Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And you think about it. Nehemiah and Elijah and Moses and many others seen their, not, uh, seen their need to cry out, confessing their sins to a holy God. <clears> oh, <throat> preacher George Whitfield said this, I believe it is difficult to go through the fiery trial of popularity and applause untainted. When I am unwilling to be told my faults, correspond with me no more. We need help. No, all of us need help. Help that only God can give. But there has to be confession because confession brings forgiveness. You've probably got it memorized, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm very thankful for that verse. I'm very, very thankful for that verse. Absolutely so. But that verse is more than just, means more than just a little prayer to soothe your conscience. Well, I've, I've, done, I've, been, I've not been doing really good, so let me see. I'll go down the altar and I'll confess my sins and God will forgive me and then, and then I can go on with life. You're missing it. No, no, no. There, there has to be repentance along with the confession. Because if it was just a confession, we might as well belong to another religion out there where you can just go and confess and then go and live your life any way you want to. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm trying to be very serious. But I'm telling you, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Hallelujah, if we really do business with God. But there's a lot of people today that come to an altar and they pray and they confess their sin and they get up off their knees and head back to their seat, listen to me, with no idea whatsoever how they're gonna change things. There's no true repentance there. I mean, they just want forgiveness, some way to soothe their conscience a little bit so they can go on with their life. But that's not what God wants. God wants us to be very serious with him that we would confess and, and no, no, to this point, oh Lord, correct me. I, I confess to you that yes, I am wrong in this, but I need help. I need you to correct me. I've tried over and over and I just keep on coming with the same old thing over and over and it continues to beset me and, and, and I need your help. Amen. So it's more than just confessing your sin. It's that cry, correct me, help me. Do something in my life that I can't do on my own. Lord, whatever it takes, I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to go this direction anymore. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to suffer through this anymore. I mean, no, no, it's more, than just that, it's, it's more than just that little prayer, I'm telling you. We've gotten to a place where we, we want to, with 1 John 1, 9, we almost want to paraphrase it to this point. If we confess our pleasures, uh, you are friendly enough to overlook our pleasures and not count them unrighteousness in your sight. But it needs to be more than that. Because when we refuse to confess and repent of our sin, listen to me please, we continue to bear that load of sin. It's still there. No, no, when we get serious with God, he gets serious with us. When we truly confess and repent, absolutely, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness and I'm so thankful for that. But I'm afraid we've gotten lost to some extent in our religiosity. I'm afraid we've got lost, please listen to me. I'm afraid we've got lost to some extent in our churchianity. We come to church, we go through the motions, we carry a Bible, we may even read it a little bit. We have a short stint of prayer every once in a while and we think that everything's okie dokie. But it might not be. It might be that you need correction from God. Come on, we have to come to God with a heart of confession. And so our prayer should be, oh Lord, I've sinned, correct me. Okay. <clears throat> Don't let me keep heading the same direction. Correct me. No, it's good preaching if I am doing it, I guarantee you. We say we want to be more like, we say we want to be more like Christ. We say we want to live the Christian life. We say, yes, I want to be a good Christian. Well, maybe we need some help that we haven't asked for yet. 
correct me. That's heartfelt confession. No, no, when we cry out for, correct, uh, for correction, that's heartfelt confession. That's a heart of repentance. That's a heart of true sorrow. And I'm telling you, friends, that brings forgiveness. When our heart is in full agreement about this matter of correction, then God cleanses us with the blood of Christ. I'm so thankful. Amen. Well, Brother Marshall, don't you know nobody likes correction? Oh, well, I know. Who likes correction? But we need it. Right. Oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Have you ever heard a child, you parents in here, have you ever had your child or have you ever heard a child say something like this to a parent? Uh, Mom, Dad, um, Will you uh, just, uh, will you just please uh, promise me you won't get mad when I tell you this? <laughs> oh, no, no, I, 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 I think that's kind of what Jeremiah is saying concerning the Lord's correction of judgment and not in anger. Uh, I think we can actually hear Jeremiah's heart in this cry. Not in that anger. Lord, I need your help. Correct me, but, but not in thine anger. And we know this. We know that God's anger consumes. Right. Right. If, lest thou bring me to nothing. Right. So Jeremiah realized that if God corrected in his anger, that that would bring destruction to the people and to himself. So he just cried out, not in anger. But here's what we have to realize. Remember, judgment from God brings forgiveness. It brings forgiveness. Had, had brought, had, had, mm, come on brain. Had God brought correction and anger, destruction would have been the result. Yeah, right. yeah. But if God would correct Jeremiah in judgment, brings forgiveness. And I'll encourage you again. It may be you need to cry out to God tonight. Oh Lord, correct me in judgment. Correct me. I, I need something that's real. I, I need to know that you've touched my life. Isn't it an amazing thing when we get saved by the grace of God, how God starts to change us? Amen. You know, he wants to continue to do that all the way through your Christian life. Amen. But we have to want it. For some reason, we seem to be afraid that God's going to give us something that we don't deserve. But that's not our God. <clears throat> That, that's not the way he operates. Uh, okay, let me, let me just remind you very briefly here. God is a, God, no, no, if, if, you're, if you're a born again child of God, if you're saved by the grace of God, your heavenly father, he's a loving, caring, wonderful, gracious, merciful, long suffering, patient, forgiving God. Amen. That's our God. No, 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 God's not mad all the time. God's not just looking for a reason to thump you every time he gets a chance. That's not our God. No, 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 no. Quit, quit, quit teaching your children that. <clears throat> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> quit teaching your children that. God's going to get you. Quit saying that to your children. I don't know where that's coming from, but I felt like I needed to say it. God's a loving, heavy, uh, caring heavenly father. Yeah. We all deserve hell. It's what we deserve. <laughs> Truly. But our God's full of grace and he's full of mercy and he's full of love. And, and he desires, I don't get it, but he desires that we be close to him. Our God wants us to be close to him. So, so let's, 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 let's think about this for a couple of minutes. How, how does the Lord correct us? I mean, if we're going to cry out for correction, how, how does the Lord correct us? Well, well, first he corrects us by his word. He corrects us by the word. Uh, really, most of us sitting here, in here today, tonight, know what the word of God says about the sin that is in your life. Amen. No, I, it wasn't a mistake the way I said that. I'll say it again. Most of us sitting here already know what the Bible says about the sin that's in your life. You already know. 
And he gave us this word, truly that we might take heed and allow it to correct us, to convict us. Come on, and to bring us to our knees seeking direction from him. Okay. I am so thankful I have this old King James Bible. I'm telling you, this is the inspired, perfect word of God for the English speaking people. And I'm thinking this is, no, no, this isn't just some book. This is the most important book in the world right here. This is the very word of God. God wants to speak to you and me through it. And that's why your preacher harps on you all the time to read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day. He's always on our case. Because he knows that if you will read this, I mean sincerely, seriously read this, that God is going to speak to your heart. And if you will take heed and listen, that God's going to do wonderful things just because you're reading the book. He wants to do that. Uh, I've told the folks at home many a time, you know, if you would just read your Bible every day and do what it says, it'd sure make my job a lot easier. <laughs> just do what it says. I, I, love, I, love, I love preaching. I love doing it. I love hearing it. And I love teaching of the Bible. I love doing it. I love hearing it. But I'm telling you, we don't have to be under preaching and we don't have to be under teaching to hear what God has to say to us. And he just wants us to take heed to be doers of the word, not hearers only. I mean, he wants us to take heed to what he has in this book. And if we will, day after day, I'm telling you, he can do wonderful things in our life. He, he wants us to do that. He wants us to take heed to his word that we might repent of those things that are in our life and live a life of true joy and fulfillment. That's what God wants for us. Absolutely so. Look, you, you may have a lack of love for God in your life. Or you may have a lack of concern, uh, of concern for the things of God. And maybe you just have a fruitless Christianity. A fruitless Christianity. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, you know you're a believer. You know you're a believer, but Christianity's not showing up on you. I mean, you're not in any danger of anybody, anybody, anybody uh, 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 calling you a Christian that you're around the most. I mean, they just don't see it. It's just kind of a fruitless Christianity. That's not what God wants. And he wants to use his word to get us to where we need to be. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, uh, thoroughly furnished uh, unto all good works. So taking heed to God's word makes a difference in our lives. It will make a difference in our lives. No, no, that's what the altars are all about. That's why, no, no, that's why we have altar calls in our churches. That's why we have times of invitation in our churches because when the word of God is preached, it's gonna to speak to somebody. It's that powerful. And if we will respond in the correct manner and come down and say, oh Lord, that's me, correct me. I wanna do better. He's a life-changing God. And he uses his word. He uses his word. <clears throat> but second, he corrects by chastening. Before I got saved by the grace of God, almost 40 years ago, I could do anything I wanted to do and lay my head down on my pillow at night and nothing bothered me. And after I got saved, since that time, I've not been able to get by with anything. And I thank God for it. I thank God for it. The Holy Spirit of God is in there. And he convicts me and at times he chastens me. Bill, why in the world did you say that? What, 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 wait, wait, son, why are you doing that? Oh no, surely you hear a voice like that. Come on, he does speak to our heart. Absolutely so. But we have to remember the Lord chastens his own, his own children. Hebrews chapter 12, verse six, the Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Right. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. And that colorful word that's there that the world has made a curse word, it's not really a curse word. It just means that you're without a father. Right. Right. And I'm telling you, no, 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 no. If you've never endured any chastening, you don't belong to God. 
No, I don't, I don't, I'd say that without any fear whatsoever. And I'm not trying to be smart. No, if you're a believer, there's going to be some chastening along the way. It is going to happen. God will work to keep you headed in the right direction. He's going to work to do that. But what we, what we need to understand for sure is chastening is not always with a rod. I know there's times that God has to do some hard chastening to get our attention and bring us back. I've been there too. I don't have time to go into that testimony, but I've been there too. But God's chastening is not always with a rod. Sometimes it's just that still small voice trying to get us back on the straight and narrow path that leads to life. Come on, there is a broad way that leads to destruction and there's a narrow way that leads to life. Come on, that passage isn't talking about salvation. No, 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 no. It's talking about there's a broad way that a lot of people take. It's not good, but there's a narrow way that leads to the abundant life. <clears throat> and sometimes God chastening is just that still small voice behind us. God saves us and he puts us on that narrow path. He puts us there. And if we, as we walk along, if we're listening to him, there'll be times he'd say, oh, no, no, don't go that way. Don't go that way. No, just stay on the path. Everything's, everything's good. It's all, no, 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 don't go that way. Don't be, don't be going over there. What are you doing? Get back over here where you belong. No, no, no. No, no okay, you trip, but it's okay. I'm going to help you. It's okay. I just want you to stay. Keep looking straight forward. Keep going forward like that. I, I'm here for you. I'm going to help you all along the way. Come on, that's our God. And sometimes, no, no, no. If we listen to that kind of chastening, we don't have to endure the hard chastening. I'm telling you, he will guide us. He will direct us. He's there for us. He loves us more than we can understand. I said, he loves you more than you can understand. I don't see how God can love me. I don't see how God can love me. I know, no, no, no. If you're out there and you're saying, oh man, God can't love me. Oh yeah, he does. Because if he loves me, he can certainly love you. And he does. And he wants to guide us. But any way that he has to correct us, he always corrects us in love. Always. No, no, you can believe me when I say that God will always correct us in love. Always. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon said, the Lord can do no unloving thing toward one of his children. Amen. Oh, I love that quote. Amen. The Lord can do no unloving thing toward one of his children. Whatever he does to try to get us to go the right way, he does it in love. And that's confidence that we all need. We need that. No, no, God loves us even when we mess up. God loves us even when we do wrong. He loves us. He's there and he's waiting and he's wanting us to come to him. God does not, please get this, if you don't get anything else to Get this, God does not chasten us for his pleasure. <laughs> We've, uh, Miss Pam and I, we have two daughters. And Sarah's here, Emily's up there in St. Joseph. She's been my secretary there in the church for 12 years now. And we, 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 we tried to, to raise them. And, and uh, there was times that I had to chasten them. And, and I, I didn't, it wasn't always for my pleasure. I mean, sometimes it was. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. God doesn't chasten us for his pleasure. He chastens us for our profit. We didn't chasten our children for our pleasure. We chastened them for their profit. God wants you to be blessed. He, he wants you to have a life full of joy. He, he wants you to enjoy your Christianity. And if he has to chasten you to get you back to that, he's doing it because he loves you more than you can understand. He always corrects us in love. And I really do believe when God has to strongly chasten us that it hurts him. I believe that. I do but we have to be taught right from wrong, don't we? That's right. And just like our own children, sometimes it involves correction from the Father. Let, let me just say this. I, <clears throat> I struggle with a, 
I, I struggle with things in my Christian life just like many of you do. I'm not standing up here trying to act like I've got it all together. Or I'm some holy Joe, whatever. No, 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 no. And sometimes, really and truly, I, sometimes I get, I get very overwhelmed by my failures. And, and, and I know that I need help that only my heavenly father can supply. Only God can help me with this. Only God can do what needs to be done. And so I go somewhere and get alone with God and cry out, oh, Lord, correct me. Help me, Lord, to be everything that you would have me to be for you and for others. Because he wants to use us. I'll say it again. He wants to use you. No, if, if you're saved by the grace of God, he wants to use you to be a light, to be salt. He wants to use you to show others there's a difference in someone that knows Christ as their Savior. It's true. And for whatever price, whatever the price may be, whatever it might cost, I want God's will done in my life. And whatever it, that may cost you or me, whatever it may cost us, whatever we have to give up, whatever we have to change, what, whatever God would have us to do, what, what, whatever that may cost us, it's uh, well worth the price. You know, some people, no, I'm, I'm right at done. I believe there's way too many people today that endure their Christianity more than they enjoy it. I believe that. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I believe that. When all they really need to do to really enjoy the fullness of Christianity is let God correct them. Lord, whatever you want in my life. Whatever you want me to pick up, whatever you want me to put down. Oh, Lord, correct me. So what about you? Are, are you in need of that which only the Lord can do? Because we need help. <clears throat> oh, Lord, Lord. I know that the way of man is not in himself. I can't do this on my own. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Psalm 121, verse 2, the Bible says, My help cometh from the Lord, which made the heaven and earth. Amen. The help that you and I need tonight, it's got to come from Him. Amen. And it will when we finally decide we really, really want it. And we're willing to cry out to God. Oh, Lord, correct me, whatever it takes. I'm tired of living the way I'm living. I'm tired of not enjoying my Christianity. I'm tired of not being the light I should be, the salt I should be. I'm, I'm tired of faking it. Correct me, Lord. Our loving Heavenly Father will do in your heart and life what only He can do. That's a fact. Father, we're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful for portions of Scripture such as this that are so clear. It's so clear. It, 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 it just cannot be misunderstood. It's right there on the printed page, straight from you. 